So my name is Douglas Thane. I'm uh, here at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, I, I actually could not fit all the contributors onto the title slide. And for that, I apologize. Uh, I'll have them all at the very end, but I'm representing a, a sort of large group of people here at, at Notre Dame and also at uh, the University of Chicago. And uh, we've been having a lot of fun over the last uh, year or so putting together um, um, Parcel in work queue in order to uh, do some interesting things with workflows. So you've heard all about Parcel. And uh, from, from where we sit, uh, we think of Parcel as a powerful Pythonic workflow programming model. I couldn't get any more Ps in there. Uh, that, that gives us uh, a, a very pleasant way of, of interfacing with end users and their workflows. And then we have the software from Notre Dame called um, uh, WorkQ, uh, which is a, a distributed uh, manager worker uh, framework that uh, it's uh, a, a, at somewhat lower level um, and allows the harnessing of a large number of machines to run uh, millions of tasks. Uh, and what WorkQ gives us is scalable, portable, robust, distributed execution. And if we put those two things together, uh, we can make a, a much more powerful system. Now, uh, WorkQ is a thing that, that does stand on its own. It's been around for a while. And we've been, uh, to this date, targeting applications uh, where the, uh, I'll, I'll say, the designers of the applications are hackers, uh, people who want to get way down into the guts of a parallel application and um, design things where they uh, react to individual tasks being uh, started and uh, completed. And uh, way down at the lowest level, it's uh, there's uh, the, the core of the API is simply you uh, create a task with some details, you submit that task, and then you wait for some tasks to finish. So it's a, a classic submit wait interface. And doing this, you can dispatch lots of things and wait for them to come back. And so we've had all sorts of applications written in the realm of, of uh, computational chemistry, um, uh, force field optimization. Uh, we've uh, worked with some friends in CMS to build a uh, distributed data analysis system, molecular dynamics, um, data mining, a wide variety of custom applications have been written to this interface. But I guess the key word there is custom. Uh, writing a WorkQ application from scratch is a bit of an undertaking and requires that you scratch your head a bit about when do I dispatch my task and, and when they come back. Um, it's nothing more than um, submit wait. So um, now on, on, on the plus side, WorkQ has some interesting capabilities. So uh, WorkQ allows you to create very elastic applications. So uh, the number of workers is not fixed. You can add them or remove them as you go. And the manager just automatically uh, accommodates what happens. Turns out this is pretty handy even in HPC situations because sometimes you're trying to backfill your application on, uh, on a cluster that's otherwise busy. And today you've got 100 machines available. Tomorrow you might have 1,000 machines available. And there's no reason to wait until you have the perfect number of machines that you want. Uh, WorkU is very robust. So if uh, tasks fail for any reason, no problem. We retract them and send them somewhere else. And the user doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, whether uh, uh, a task gets uh, evicted because of some local failure or because the worker crashed or because somebody pulled the power plug or somebody consumed all the memory on the machine, we could detect all those things and, uh, and handle them cleanly. Uh, WorkQ does data management. So in a WorkQ system, we don't presume um, the presence of a shared file system. We presume that every worker has its own local storage. And part of the job of the manager is to manage that local storage to make sure the right files are in the right place at the right time. And as a result, this has a pretty dramatic effect on um, data access time and network utilization compared to using a shared file system. In the common case, if you have a data set that's shared between all of your nodes, once you get a first round of tasks going, that data gets uh, stored at those local nodes and it stays there throughout the run. Uh, WorkQ does resource management. So for every worker and every task, we keep track of resources such as cores and memory and disk. Uh, and we know who's consuming what and how much they're supposed to be consuming. And so if you have a task that's supposed to be using a gigabyte of memory, but explodes and suddenly is using 16 gigabytes of memory, well, we whack that task on the head, bring it back, and give it back to the user with a report that says what happened. Um, now, sometimes that's due to a bug. Something went wrong with your memory allocator. Sometimes that's due to the nature of your data, in which case maybe you want to reschedule that and put it on a machine that has uh, more memory available uh, so you can finish the task. 
And uh, WorkU is language agnostic. It is at core written in C, but you can interface it uh, through Python or Perl or C. And we also have Swig and JSON bindings if you have uh, other languages that you are um, fond of using. Now, I don't want to make this too much an advertisement about WorkU, but more about the interface between WorkU and Python. So we presented this last year. And uh, you know, like any academic talk, you should always assume that the first round of something is really just a Rube Goldberg machine. And uh, I hope everybody here knows what a Rube Goldberg machine was, but he was this fellow who wrote these cartoons about 100 years ago of long, elaborate ways of doing simple things. And so here we have a complex machine designed to do nothing but staple a couple pieces of paper together. So the alarm clock rings and the wheel spins and the balls roll out of the cup and then finally the shoe stomps on the stapler. So last year um, we had a little prototype that worked, but this year um, it's as simple as conda install, CC tools and parcel together and it all works. And of course, everybody knows that if it's in Conda, it must be perfect and bug free and everything will work right out of the box, right? Of course, no software is perfect, but I think we've come uh, a long way and uh, um, I, I think we have a nice product uh, put together here. All right, so here's the architecture. Uh, so we have a stack of uh, things that run on the manager over here on the left. So, uh, you know, through parcel, you write a Python program that generates function invocations. And those get passed down to the parcel data flow kernel that manages all of the dependencies and puts them in order. Uh, and then uh, we've written a new parcel work queue executor that's now part of the parcel um, mainline code. And that translates from parcel function invocations into work queue task generations. And that gets passed to the work queue manager and it all runs in the same address space. Now, from the perspective of work queue, a task is a process to be run that has certain input files and produces known output files. And so initially, those things that you're going to process exist in the local file system. That is to say the file system on the same node where parcel and the work queue manager run. Now the job of the manager is to identify some appropriate workers and send over the data as well as the tasks in order to uh, execute that job. Now these workers uh, can be anywhere. So, so we have some facilities to make it easy to deploy workers on HT Condor systems, on PBS, Slurm, Amazon EC2, we've run on Blue Waters, OSG, Exceed, um, all over the place. Um, and however those workers happen to get started, uh, when they wake up, they call home to the manager and say, here I am. I have 16 cores and 16 megabytes of memory and uh, some disk space. So send me what you need to send me and I will run it. Now, when tasks run, they run on a worker over here. Whoops. When tasks run, they run on a worker, and they only access the local storage. So again, the manager has to coordinate the data getting over there. But once tasks run, they run at full speed on the data that's on the local storage, and they should not be stalling on accessing remote data sources. All right, so we have lots of workers, one manager, and the manager coordinates everything. Now, when we put these all together, you get the nice programming interface of Python and all of its features. And now we have an elastic, dynamic, robust, fault tolerant backend. Now, we've been looking at a couple specific issues in, in, in this integration. And, and I think I'll, I'll introduce them by saying, sort of looking backwards a little bit and thinking how batch computing has evolved at least uh, uh, since I've been involved in it uh, for a few years. So when I got started in distributed computing, usually the way that we thought about harnessing a cluster was to say, I have a large number of tasks to run. And typically each task is a complete program, a complete application to run. And um, you know each machine is yeah, roughly sized more or less to run one application at a time. So over here on the left, I have a cluster that consists of a couple machines that have one core, some that have two core, and one that has four cores. And they all have some shared distributed file system. Maybe it's NFS or Panassis or Hadoop, something like that. And now the job of the scheduler is to identify all of the machines that are capable of running a task. And so in this case, our task was too big to fit on a one gigabyte machine, but it fits on the two gigabyte machines and it fits on the four gigabyte machines. And at least in the old it's days, we'd say, all right, to, uh, scheduler's job. To jump in. Just to jump yeah. in for a second. Uh, so you're now up to nine to 10 minutes, so. Oh my gosh, already? Yep. How much, how many do I have left? Uh, maybe two or three more. Oh, 
I'll take three. All right. So in, in, in the new world order, we're thinking of big, about big fat machines. But it's also the case that the tasks have gotten smaller. So instead of thinking big processes, we're thinking individual functions. And the job is not to run one task per machine. It's to figure out how many tasks I can pack into a given machine. And a side effect of this is we end up putting a much greater load in the shared file system as each of those tasks runs. So the question is not, what's the best node to run this program on? It's how many tasks can I run on this node at once? All right, pop quiz. Dan, you have your microphone on, so I'm going to ask you, what are the two most terrifying words in the Python language? Uh, packaging and installation. Oh, that's that's a good guess. How, how do you like import TensorFlow? Pretty pretty well connected, right? So import TensorFlow is sort of the first two words of 50% of programs that get run on our, our campus clusters now. And import TensorFlow is a terrifying command because it imposes a huge load on a shared file system as all of these functions that we want to run load all these different modules. Um, you can, it can impose millions and millions of operations just to get something started. So uh, we went out and did some measurements here. And uh, the time to import TensorFlow on Comet and Theta, when we start getting up into hundreds of nodes, runs into, uh, let's see, what do we have over here? 700 seconds, 1,400 seconds. We're talking 9, 10, 15 minutes to do nothing but import TensorFlow when we're running on lots of nodes. So in our integration of these two tools, we came up with a nice solution by which we use static analysis to identify just the modules that we need, send them over efficiently to local storage on the nodes, and then access them efficiently. And as a result, we get program startups that are measured in a handful of seconds instead of 10 minutes. Challenge number two, how do we know how many functions to pack on a node? Well, what we've come up with here, and, and I can thank Ben Tovar for this technology here, is what we call a lightweight function monitor. And a lightweight function monitor is a bit of um, Python and C code that work together to measure how much Re how many resources a single Python function does. Now, it does this by a bit of a trick by which it forks a new process in the background in order to run that function, and then using the Unix process capabilities is able to measure um, the core's memory and disk used by an individual function. Turns out that's reasonably efficient because we're relying on the copy on write capability of the underlying operating system. And so we have a nice setup by which we can measure, and oh my gosh, where did those hearts come from? Did I do that? Uh, that, that's your, uh, your, your at three minutes now. Oh, does that, so does that mean you like this slide or you've had enough and you want me to stop? Uh, stop as soon as you can. Okay. So if you like this, uh, uh, there's a nice setup here where it's very easy to use. You import some Python and use this lovely monitored keyword in front of your function and you get back the information that you want. All right. So we put it all together using LFMs and, uh, and the packaging, and we can pack lots of tasks efficiently into big machines. If you like how that sounds, Zhuzhou and Tim are going to give a tutorial on it this afternoon. And I want to thank uh, all of our contributors from Notre Dame and Chicago and the NSF and the DOE for supporting it. And uh, we'll look forward to putting these things together. Thanks very okay, much. Thank you. So we will take uh, one quick question if we have one, or if not, we'll go on. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, it, it's clearly uh, a lot of work and it's getting incorporated into Parcel and it's uh, getting used by people. So I think it's it's good. And uh, if people have questions, there certainly are ways to contact Doug afterwards. Uh, okay, it helps, there's a question in the chat. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Doug, I don't know if you can see it, but it's how is WQ scheduler different than native Parcel scheduler or Funcox? So if by scheduling you mean what task to run next, we're not very interested in that question because not too many people have that problem or, or not too many people are constrained by that problem. I will say that WorkU's resource management is different in as much it is very focused on understanding the resources needed by a task and making sure that we pack in the right number of tasks into a given resource to understand whether a task exceeds its resource allocation, and then to take an appropriate action afterwards. So one of the things that work you can do is keep statistics on the resource consumption of a given category of tasks so that we know you, know, you may have this histogram of resource consumption. And then it has some clever ways of um, selecting how many resources to allocate for a task within that category. 
think that's the shortest answer I can give.